Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Rosling, and I'm one of the lawyers that brought this case on appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. And my colleague Michael, Micah Clark and I are here, and we will be moderating the press conference today. Thank you all for coming. This is a great day for the Peel watershed, for the First Nations in the Yukon, and for all Yukoners. We achieved a resounding success today in the Supreme Court of Canada with the unanimous judgment of the court, completely vindicating the plight of these plaintiffs throughout the courts in the Yukon and now here at the Supreme Court of Canada. It's a huge victory and you're going to hear from each of our clients in a moment who I will introduce in turn about their views on the judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada. But for the moment, I did want to acknowledge that it was a unanimous judgment and a complete success for these plaintiffs. We have strong statements of the court around the interpretation of modern treaties, the procedure to be taken under Chapter 11 of the Umbrella Final Agreement in respect of other land use planning processes that may follow the Peel process, and the next steps in respect of the Peel watershed land use planning process. In respect of uh, what was before the court, there were two issues, and that is the step in the land use planning process for the Peel that the process needed to get sent back to. The Court of Appeal was sending it back to a far earlier stage of the process that would allow Yukon government to have a redo of the Peel planning process. That was entirely rejected by the Supreme Court of Canada. The second question that was before the court was the ability to reject in the land use planning process at the final stage. The court declined to provide an interpretation on that issue, but did give some really strong guidance for future land use planning processes in the future and the ability of the parties to reject in the final instance. As I said earlier, in respect of this land use planning process, the Peel land use planning process, the court said that the Court of Appeal got it wrong and unfairly gave Yukon government a do-over. And they agreed with the First Nations and the environmental organizations that were represented in front of the court that the process should go back to the stage of the final land use plan that was tabled by the Peel Watershed Land Use Planning Commission. They also gave guidance on the duties of Yukon government in the consultation process that will evolve from the next stage. They will be limited to the modifications that were brought forward earlier. And if further modifications are to be made, the court was very clear. Those modifications must be minor. They must be subject to meaningful consultation with the First Nations and all Yukoners and Yukon affected communities. They can take into account any changing circumstances that have occurred during the course of the Land Use Planning Commission. And they can take into account the, anything that arises during consultation. So at the final stage of decision making on whether to accept, reject, or modify, Yukon government is limited to the modifications that they submitted earlier. They are limited to any meaningful consultation and what arises there and they are limited to any changing circumstances. Well, what does that mean for the appeal in the final analysis? In our view, it is not open for Yukon government to reject at this stage. They are limited to the modifications that were introduced earlier and consultation that arises out of that consultation. The reason we say that is that Yukon government took the position in the Supreme Court of Canada and the court acknowledged this in their reasons today that there were no changing circumstances in this case. So Yukon government will be limited to any circumstances that have arisen since we, the hearing in March and any decision that they make on the appeal is subject only to the consultation that will take place on the final recommended plan. That's our analysis of the case on the appeal. As I said, there was a, a fair amount of guidance that the court made about future land use planning processes in the Yukon. 
There was some very good language about the duty of, uh, of treaty partners to interpret modern treaties generously. We've heard that language from the court before, and the court was consistent in terms of their judgment on interpretation of modern treaties and indicated that that obligation is on Yukon government here. So that is uh, enough for me for now. Of course, we'll be open to questions in a few moments uh, once each of uh, our clients have uh, spoken. And at this point, I'd like to introduce each of the appellants here that brought this case to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, to my right behind me is uh, Chief Roberta Joseph. She is Chief of the Tronda Quechen First Nation. Chief Simon Mervin, here in the red, is the Chief of Nachanayak Dun. Chief Bruce Charlie, at the end to my left, is the Chief of Vuntut Quechen. And of course, we have representatives of the two environmental organizations that uh, helped bring this case forward Chris Ryder the Executive Director of Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, Yukon Chapter, and Christina McDonald, who is the Executive Director of Yukon Conservation Society. Also with me here is Micah Clark, uh, a colleague of mine in our law firm in Vancouver. And I also want to acknowledge that uh, Tom Berger, who was a pivotal part of, uh, of this case all through the process through the courts, wasn't able to join us today, but I know he's watching and um, is very, very pleased with the result. Thank you very much. I'll now turn it over to Chief Joseph. Good afternoon, everyone and everyone here and good morning to uh, everyone back at home because it's uh, still still morning there. Uh, I'm really honored to be here today uh, to uh, speak on the judgment of the Supreme Court for the Peel Land Use Plan and first of all I would like to pay my respect and uh, appreciation to the Algonquin Nation for hosting us on their traditional lands. For several years We've been on a long twisting journey to, to hold the Yukon government accountable for promises made during the land claims process and to protect an area valuable to our First Nations and so many other Yukoners. Today, I'm extremely pleased to arrive on a path of certainty on the Peel Land Use Plan. The decision from the Supreme Court of Canada has upheld our final agreements and is the outcome and it's the outcome that we were hoping for. This is a victory for the Peel watershed and the integrity of our final agreements. This is a victory for everyone who believed in the collaboration planning process described in them. This is a victory for democracy, Yukon First Nations and Yukoners. We're optimistic that we would have succeeded for some time we had already felt like we had succeeded and for how this issue has rallied has rallied so many of us behind the common goals of ensuring government uphold their promises these promises were made with Yukon First Nations in our final agreements and as well as providing certainty uh, for the Peel planning consultation and its valuable ecological region our choice was never to go to court but the former government's idea of dealing with Peel land use planning breached our final agreements and we had no choice but to protect them. It's our preference to be living with the vision for this important natural area, the vision that our people and the Yukon public spent countless hours sharing uh, with us their numerous community, uh, numerous community sessions and all of their input on how important this area was and how they wanted to see it used. We're grateful for the Supreme Court's judgment and hopeful for expectations to the Yukon's land, land use planning process. We look forward to completing the appeal and the work ahead of us with Yukon government. Masi Cho, have a good day. Thank you, Chief Joseph. We'll next hear from Chief Mervyn of Nachanayak Dun. Thank you. I would just want to say that uh, I wish to thank the people of Yukon and the Yukon people for all the hard work that they've done. It took a lot of years, but here we are. 
And I want to say good morning to all the trappers and the people out on the land. And I want to assure them that we're on the right path for environmental protection and preserve the integrity of the environment. This took a lot of years, but working together collaboratively and with respect to the agreements that we had put in place, bearing in mind that the, the agreements were drafted for protection of the people of Yukon, Yukoners in general, and Yukon First Nations in particular. And I want to say again that you guys out on the land with your families, we're doing a good job. We're all doing a good job together. So with that, I know it's early out there, boys. But have a good day. Masi cho. So di sangi. Thank you, Chief Mervin. I've just been advised that we've only got time for one more opening statement, and so I'm going to invite Chief Charlie from Vuntet Kwichin. Thank you, Chief Charlie. Good afternoon, everyone. The Vuntet Kwichin government is extremely pleased with the uh, landmark decision, which benefits all Canadians, Indigenous people across the country, the, the land and the wildlife. The highest court in Canada has ruled in favor of this protection and it could not come at a better time. Canada can lead the way when it comes to environmental and wildlife protection. Thank you very much to the Supreme Court of Canada. Thank you. Thank you for your brief comments, uh, Chief Charlie. And in light of that, I'd like to have Christina McDonald come up and have a brief statement on behalf of Yukon Conservation Society. Thank you. Christina McDonald, Executive Director of the Yukon Conservation Society. Um, we have a victory before us today. Uh, we, this case hinged on a process. We upheld that process. Uh, that process that was negotiated in modern day treaties that bring people together for a common goal, the protection of the Peel watershed. And it allowed us to stop a government that went off the rails. It is a vital democratic process that must be defended. And that is what we've accomplished today. There is still work to be done when the final consultations start again. We need everyone out. We need, we need to hear from you. We need to hear that you're upholding the final recommended plan. So today, is a victory for the land, for the water, for democracy, and the people, and it's something we should all be very proud of. I'd like to turn it over to Chris Ryder for uh, a brief statement as well. Thank you very much. My name is Chris Ryder. I'm the executive director of CPOS Yukon. Uh, I'd like to very quickly acknowledge the 20 years of work that it's taken to get to this point. It's been an incredible journey and there's been so many people who have put in so much effort to get us here today. Like 20 years, seriously. It's a long time to be working on one campaign to protect this area. Um, personally, this is important to me because I want my future grandchildren to be able to hike and camp in wild places like the Peel Watershed. I want them to be able to live in a world where bears, caribou, wolves and lynx exist in wild spaces, not just in zoos. And I want one day my imaginary grandchildren to be able to go paddling in the Peel watershed like I can today. And for that reason, this is important. And so I thank the Supreme Court for their ruling today. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be standing here with so many incredible people. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And now we'll take uh, questions from um, the folks in the room. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, Sean McCarthy from the Global Mail. You, you have mentioned that the court um, was uh, silent on the issue of uh, whether the government could reject the, um, the final recommendation, and the Court of Appeal said it could. Um, so um, what would happen if that, was, if that was the case? I know the current government says it will not, but um, 
Is there a process in place? What would happen if the government decided to just reject it? Thank you very much. And it's, it's a good question. It really comes to the heart of what we heard today from the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, they took a different approach to the case and, um, and really did focus on the fact that in this case, there were proposed modifications at the recommended plan stage. And because government of Yukon, that government, the previous government, took that uh, approach, those modifications um, led to the next stage in the process. Uh, they felt that they did not have to determine uh, whether or not there's an ultimate right to reject in the land use planning process under the umbrella final agreement. Uh, but they said the conduct has to build one stage after the other. It has to be a conversation between Yukon government, First Nations and all Yukoners. That's what the umbrella final agreement says. Uh, they did find that the conduct of the former government in taking the approach that it did in a purport purporting to approve a plan of its own, that was conduct that was unlawful. And in order to deal with that unlawful conduct, they found that it had to go back to the stage where the unlawful conduct occurred, and that is the stage of the final recommended plan. I said earlier that we believed on our review of our judgment this morning that it's not open to the Yukon government to reject in this case. And that is because of their finding, based on an admission that was made by Yukon government in front of the court, that there were no changing circumstances in this case. And the court expressly repeated that in this case and said that in terms of the future land use planning process for the Peel, what had to happen is we take it back to the final recommended plan stage. Yukon government and the First Nations then have to determine what modifications they might want to the final recommended plan. Consultation will occur on the basis of those very trans transparent modifications. If something comes up in those consultations, or if there are changing circumstances that occur during the process of this final stage, that of course can be taken into account by Yukon government in deciding whether to further modify that plan. But in making that decision, they are bound to act in a manner that's consistent with the honor of the Crown and that fosters reconciliation with Aboriginal people. And any modifications have to be only minor. There's a fair amount of language in the judgment here that will be important for the Peel watershed case and also for future cases under the land use planning process in Yukon around what is open to the parties to do when they decide to modify. It can only be very limited modifications. Does that mean minor modification, for example, I know you want to protect 80% of the Peel watershed. Uh, could that go be smaller, 75 or 70%? Would that be a minor modification? Now, that, that will all have to unfold as the process unfolds. We're at very early stages, of course. But we are guided by the statements of the court and the very clear guidance that was given to the parties. And that is, any modifications have to be minor. And as I say, there's a fair amount of language in the judgment about what that means. But in the circumstances of that case, we are going to have to look at what unfolds with consultation. We're going to look at what circumstances exist today, but in all cases, only minor modifications can be considered by Yukon government in respect of non-settlement land. Do you have the address, you know, just what's at stake here, aside from the process? I mean, they talked about the process, but talk to us about the land and, and what it means to the people uh, of the Yukon and, and their own people. Absolutely, and I'll invite one of the chiefs to respond, and um, it may be appropriate because the Umbrella Final Agreement does state that it's with respect to affected Yukon communities and it's binding on all Yukoners. We may want to have a quick statement from um, either Christina or Chris on that as well, and I'll ask um, one of the chiefs to respond. Thank you for that question. Uh, what's at stake in terms of uh, the, the land and what it means to us? Um, this, this region is, uh, is almost a pris pristine region. It has beautiful, clear, sparkling rivers where we can go and drink the water from. And there's uh, a lot of food on the land for us. Our people use the land for food. Uh, we, go, we harvest food, we harvest medicines. Uh, one of our elders always says, this is our university and our hospital. And uh, that's what's at stake here. Uh, this is one of the only regions in 
uh, the Yukon that's uh, intact, um, especially in some of our traditional territories where there's a lot of activity going on already. And so being able to have a region where we can still go and harvest um, from the land and use the land. Uh, we have trapping concessions all over in that region. And so this area is valuable to us. Our people have, our ancestors have walked this land for uh, centuries, thousands of years. And, you know, there's artifacts that go back thousands of years. And um, so we continue to still use this land today. It's valuable for us. And we continue to use it to teach our youth about our history, our traditional knowledge. And that's where we go to bond and have our spiritual and holistic, uh, where we gain back our, our spiritual and holistic strength from the land. Thank you. Can I just ask one of the two lawyers, I know you wanted to make your statement, but just quickly, one of the two lawyers, I know you've only had a few hours to process this ruling, but is there anything in the language um, that has implications for other provinces and other territories and the relationship uh, for, for land and use agreements there. Is this, is it Yukon-centric or can, does it make an impact outside of Yukon's borders? Yeah, thanks for the question. There is broad language at the beginning of the judgment that gives guidance to interpreting all modern treaties. It's not just limited to the Yukon final agreements. And so that language will guide how provincial governments or federal governments um, will interpret the provisions for sort of mirroring land use planning uh, chapters of their agreements as well. So, uh, there's there's provisions in the NISCA final agreement, for instance, that, that have similar decision processes along the way, uh, and this will guide how the provincial government can make those decisions. And really what the court is saying is when a provincial or, or territorial government can say yes or no to land use, environmental, other decisions under a final agreement, that has to be in a way that gives life to the objectives of the treaty. And here, what they said the objective of the treaty was that this is a collaborative process. And so if Yukon government could modify in a large way or reject in a large way, that disregards the collaboration between the parties leading up to it. And so that sort of guidance, that big picture guidance, will guide decision making by federal, provincial, and territorial governments and other treaties. So when you call it a landmark ruling, is it landmark because of the time it's taken or because of, of the implications that it could have for you know, other provinces and territories? Uh, it's a landmark in that it confirms the the honor of the crown and the role of the crown in implementing all modern treaties. So the big picture language that the court gives is language that applies from sea to sea, from anywhere from Nunavut Tungavik and in the Nunavut Land Claims Agreement to NISCA Final Agreement in British Columbia, Yukon Final Agreements, and all the way east. So it's a landmark in the sense that it guides how decision-making processes under those treaties are going to be made. And it again confirms these principles of the, the strict language of the, the treaties, of the modern claims agreements, uh, aren't just to be taken out of context. They have to be read in a purposive manner in accordance with the honor of the crown. And so that guides all the various iterations of the crown from uh, across the country. You've stated your view of the ruling, but could Yukon not argue, look, circumstances have changed. Respectfully, we disagree. And uh, we are going to reject the agreement, uh, the final plan. Yeah, the process, as as my colleague Marky said, the process has been returned to the final agreement, to, to the, the stage at which the commission has delivered its final recommended plan to the parties. And what the court has said, now the parties are to consult. Yukon government consults with the Yukon First Nations and with affected Yukon communities, and we'll see what comes out of that. The court has given guidance that will limit what Yukon government can ultimately do, and they have to make, at the end of the day, a decision that's in good faith and furthers the process of reconciliation. But it's too early to say precisely what position any of the parties will take because we're sent back to this process where now the parties, in good faith, are going to sit down together and consult as they should have the first time around. Before you sit down and, and do this consultation. Perhaps I'll pass that over to... Uh, just maybe make a sure. few other comments. And um, in addition to what um, Mike has said about the um, the importance to, um, to other... Um, First Nations that have modern land claim agreements, uh, it really is around the approach that the court took to intervention of the courts in respect of modern treaties uh, and the processes that have been agreed to under modern treaties. They have made some statements about um, the limited nature of judicial intervention 
and that uh, the parties must and Yukon government must and all governments under modern treaties must interpret those provisions in a very generous way. This isn't an ordinary commercial contract. They have to be interpreted generally and their conduct has to be consistent with the honour of the Crown. And, and that will be part of what will be taken on board for all modern land claims agreements in Canada and it's important and it's, um, there's some very good uh, language from the court in, in respect of that. And in, in, in just to your question on our view on reject, just to add to what Micah also said, uh, remember what I indicated earlier and that is the admission by Yukon government in March when we were before the court that there were no changing circumstances, there was no change of circumstances that they were relying on. The court said that at this stage what has to happen is we go back to consultation and at the end of the day Yukon government is faced with having to make a decision, but it has to make a decision that is based on any changing circumstances. They've admitted that there weren't any up until March. What comes out of consultation, and in any of a, in any event, in a manner that's consistent with the honor of the crown and fostering reconciliation with Aboriginal people. But the consultations that now take place uh, result in oh, there are changing circumstances. Would that not them give? give them some room to reject the agreement, the uh, final plan? We don't think it's open to Yukon government to do that. And uh, to answer a further question, I don't remember uh, who, when, when is all this going to happen? Well, um, give us the rest of the day and the weekend to absorb and, um, and celebrate this decision. I think it's important to the First Nations, our, our clients that represent um, Yukoners, that, to get on with this. And we will be working hard with this government to get on with it. And uh, there have been some very strong indications from this government that they um, want to do just that and that they uh, want to proceed with this process in a manner that's consistent with the judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, spell it your, your name and title for it. Sure. My name is Margaret Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G, and I'm counsel for the appellants. Any further questions? Thank you all very much for coming and have a good weekend.